We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Okay. Welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with myself, Jackie Jones, and Mr. Bob Cook. And this is episode 116, Bob, by my reckoning. Oh, good. I just took my glasses off when you introduced me there. I'm not sure why I did that. But anyway... Hundred and what did you say? Sixteen. Hundred and sixteen. Oh, we're, we're climbing up the uh, <laughs> climbing up the the panel or whatever. We are, we are, and I think when well, last time when I looked on how many, I think we'd had something like thirty five thousand listens or downloads of this podcast or whatever since we started, which is amazing. Good. We average about two hundred and forty, two hundred and fifty every seven days. Yeah. Oh, the first seven days, anyway. That's yeah. picking tails off. And uh, we've got listeners on YouTube, so we've got listeners on there, and we've also got them on. I think and we used to do it on Anchor, but Anchor's been took over by Spotify now. Oh my God! So I know I can't get in anymore through Anchor. So well, you can. It's just that it's Spotify that's doing it. It's all very complicated, but yeah. So so you can either watch us or you can listen to us. But I think it's you know we we've done good at this, Bob. We've been doing it for. Long time. 116 episodes now, Kiking. all through the pandemic and everything. So the topic of this session is tissues and tea. Tissues and tea. <laughs> which I love the title, Bob. <laughs> I picked this one because a friend of mine, oh, I don't know how many moons ago it was, a gestalt psychotherapy, said that he just written an article on the use of tissues in the psychotherapeutic room. And that tickled my fancy. And um i never got to ask him what he meant by that and also i never read the article <laughs> <laughs> but i know what I, I i think he means by it and i haven't read the article so uh but I, I do like the title and what i mean by it is different views on how to be with clients in the therapeutic room so if we talk to psychoanalysts for example let's, let's say psychoanalysts and the, there are people who are into interpretation. They may be Freudian, Jungian. Uh, there could be some of the later psychoanalysts they're inf influenced by. Um, they don't have to be working necessarily with couches anymore. Uh, but they're very much into interpretation. And self-awareness is the uh, uh, important curative factor. Yeah. Whereas if we look people, say from the disciplines I got trained in, um, relationship is the curative factor. And we could we could look at behavioralists, we could look at um, CBT, we could look at many of the holistic therapies as well. And they may have different focuses. But if you, if you ask the psychoanalyst um, about tissues and tea, or the use of tissues and tea in the psychotherapy room, they would probably say immediately, Tea, tea, we don't give it out tea. My gosh, um, uh, they come at uh, on the hour and they leave 50 minutes after that. And, um, you know, if they're going to want us to take care of their needs, then they need to go into a different type of therapy because once we start making tea for them, we could be encouraging infantilization. And actually, what's really important for us is that we encourage self agency rather than infantilization. So making a cup of tea for their clients would be, I think theoretically anyway, I'm not saying all psychoanalysts at this point, but theoretically heresy. It's funny, isn't it? Because I, I can't imagine doing therapy any other way than the way that I was taught and the way that I do it, which, you know, having a cuppa, whether whether it's or a drink, there's I don't think you can see it, but behind my chair there, there's always a jug of water and some glasses so that they can have water if they want it, or they can have tea or coffee. It's it's par for the course. And that's because you were trained holistically. Yeah. It's because oh well, I, I, rather than me making assumptions, yeah, rather than me making assumptions, 
what's the thinking behind offering clients a cup of tea again i'm assuming you mean um when they come through the door yes yeah yeah not in the middle of the therapeutic process no no it's a, it's a welcome i always welcome them in and ask them how they are and say would you like a drink tea coffee water anything okay so what is the thinking behind that if there is any for me it's to put them at ease and it's to start building up that relationship with them oh, oh. so you know, the thinking behind it for you is to twofold one yeah. to make them you know at ease yeah because they might have I, I don't know they might have walked to your office they might have come across town they may have come through the rain they may have had a stressful day yeah um, so making a cup of tea would be um you know making them at ease from your frame of reference um what was the second thing you said um building up the relationship yes yeah yeah so for you it would also i think they go together those two things don't they helping them ease uh, taking care uh building up the relationship they sort of all go in the same ballpark yes frame of reference okay it's interesting because for 38 years i did the same thing probably from the same frame of reference however um no, and I didn't ever change it because I, I ended up seeing people clinically at when I was the, you know, four years ago now, uh, when I was 69. Um, I don't think I ever changed that habit, if you like. However, I run a lot of supervision groups and I meet a lot of supervisors from other disciplines. Yeah. As well as, you know, psychoanalysts I've just talked about. And when when we talk about how do you... Uh, meet your clients for example um you've got variation of complete variation of responses um one of the most common is um when they go up to the therapy room there might be glasses of water on the table but there certainly isn't tea they certainly don't make tea for them uh -huh. Um, you get some people who follow the psychoanalytical view, which I'm calling it the psychoanalytical view. Maybe that's unfair. But the theory is by making tea for them, you aren't encouraging self-agency. And secondly, they might be doing out of pleasing you. And um, I think that was a, probably the favourite response of all of them. Um, I had a discussion with one group of therapists about this. And they said, oh, no, we're never going to cup of tea we do actually leave some water for them but you know have you ever asked your clients about this so anyway after that i decided to ask i was running a psychotherapy group and i made a cup of oh no i said him they went and made their own cup of tea um and i, I was talking about this and she he, she said oh well um i think you know when, when you make me a cup of tea i might just adapt to you rather than think what I actually want. Interesting. Which is an interesting answer. And yeah. it follows that psychoanalytical view of um, maybe unconsciously or out of my awareness, supporting uh, adaptation or at its worst, infantilization, rather than promoting self-agency. Yeah. Same with tissues getting onto tissues. So I think the article is completely about that, what I've just said. Yeah. Is that by providing, I think the article was more about, you know, if there's a box of tissues in the room, do you actually pass the tissue box to the client or do you encourage the client to move for the tissue box themselves? A thinking behind that, would be around empowerment and self-agency rather adaptation to the therapist who might think that the client wants to have a tissue. The, the, this is all very deep and meaningful stuff, Bob. <laughs> On the surface, you, you, do you know what I mean? For, for some of the listeners, they might think, what does it matter whether you pass them a tissue or they go to get it themselves? But there's so many layers to this and, you know, I was talking with one of my clients this week and it's kind of like 
you know, the, the conversation that goes on between two people, we say something and we put it out there and the other person picks it up. And in the middle, it can be misunderstood from what our intention is to what they actually receive at the other end. And I think that with the tissues is one of those situations. Well, it could be. I mean, that's one way of looking at it. But I think philosophically, we are talking about very important absolutely philosophical values, which is yeah. what I think you meant when you said it may appear um, XXX with clients and therapists and, you know, what are we actually talking about? But I actually think that philosophically, they're very different positions. Yes. Oh, yeah. So yeah. One is, well, I wouldn't pass a, a tissue to my client or even make them a cup of tea because I'm encouraging self-agency, not adaptation. Mm. On the other end of the spectrum is where you and I, me particularly for 40 or 30 odd years, probably sounds like you and many of my colleagues, by the way, um, offer tea and coffee out of what you've just said, not just, you know, self-care, modeling self-care, courtesy, building up the relationship. So you've got two different, almost philosophical ways of thinking. Yeah. And I think they're important. Yeah. I don't think they're, I think at one level, I think it's like, um, how can I explain this? Going down the onion level. So one level, we could say, well, it doesn't really matter, does it? On another level, I think that, both sides of the polarity would be very, maybe very indignant about the other side of the polarity. Yeah. And I can understand what you're saying. You know, if, if you're doing relational psychotherapy, then the relationship is important. Whereas if you've been, you know, analytical or whatever, but that seems really clinical to me. Well, I think if you are promoting self-agency, that means promoting people being in their adult in the here yeah. and, now and not adapting to the therapist or being young or regressing or infantilizing, then there's a huge discussion around, well, they need to decide for themselves whether they whether or they do or don't want tissues and psychotherapy. They want. To, they need to decide for themselves whether they make a cup of tea or not. Yeah. Not have a parent figure in inverted commas might perceive it that way in the discussion, making decisions for them, just like their own history. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the situation how it would play out in my therapy room if if I didn't offer whether they would say you know, can I have a cup of tea, please? And I'm not sure any of my clients would actually say that. I don't know. I, that might be me making assumptions, but I don't know whether that's the British way, do you know what I mean, that we need oh, to be no, offering no. something. I'm no, not sure. Now, that's an interesting one, bringing cultural scripts and cultural thinking. Uh, it's a really interesting deviation in the discussion. Yeah. I know I certainly wouldn't. If I was going, to, you know, in the, the many years that I've been in therapy, I don't think I would say that to my therapist. Well, what wouldn't you say to your therapist? I wouldn't ask them for, I might ask for a glass of water, but I certainly wouldn't go down the tea or coffee route. I don't know why there's a difference in that. But to me, asking for water is a lot more acceptable than asking somebody for a cup of tea or coffee. I don't know. Well, the... It's important, isn't it? Because if you think of the projection onto the therapist as maybe a significant other person, now you, you can go both ways with that. You, as I said, in the encouragement of developing self-agency, then it's up to the client if they make themselves a cup of tea, have a drink of water, nothing else, because that would be like from an adult frame. Now, out of courtesy, they might ask the therapist, but if there's just a, you know, a kitchen there, they might go and make it themselves. On the other side, which is again where I come from and you come from, building the relationship, and it even let's put it another way around, even under the guise of what we call, could call a reparative relationship. So you and I have done a podcast on reparenting, on reparative yeah. relationships and working developmentally, then making a cup of tea 
for them or passing them a tissue when they've never had a parent that might have accounted for them can be deemed very therapeutic. Absolutely. I can remember many, many years ago, must be must be 30 years ago, maybe, I was working in a, a, a school in Stafford for, um, it was a one for behavioural difficulties, kids that had been excluded or, you know, they had issues and things like that. And one of them had absconded, they'd run away. And we found him and brought him in. And the first thing that we did, we always did, whenever one of the kids had a kick off or they had a, you know, a meltdown or whatever it was, was we'd make toast and tea. They had tea and toast. We'd sit them down in the kitchen and this, this big dining table and we'd just sit with them, but we'd give them tea and toast. And it was very therapeutic just doing that for them. Mm. Mm. Taking account of them. Absolutely. So there is something, you know, nurturing and, and like you said, psychological and everything about food and drink, as in, you know, giving somebody sustenance or whatever. I don't know, but it, it meant a lot to those kids. Yeah, because it represents safety. Yeah. Represents security um, at a very deep level in terms of survival processes. So I, I understand that. And that's why I said, if you work in a developmental, relational way, then I understand very much the discussion around making tea, passing tissues around, coming from a nurturing place, uh, you know, encouraging a reparative experience is all in my therapeutic lens. Yeah. It's interesting, though, isn't it, that from a nether lens, you know, that may be seen as a regressive yeah. fantasization, disempowerment. Yeah. And I can see that as you're self-hating. talking about it. Yeah. That's interesting, though, isn't it? Absolutely. I think, I think it really is. And I think there are two different positions. Now, as you said way back at the early podcast, I think there's middle grounds, the shades of grey. Yeah. Um, on the continuum. It doesn't have to be one end of the polarity or the other. It could be many therapeutic approaches which would take different positions up on the continuum. Yeah. You know, I was just thinking... Um, while we were talking actually would I change my position on this what we're talking about now yeah the decades I was a therapist because I didn't change it even no. though I have thought about what we're discussing many times and I think that I've always been a therapist that's thought developmentally I've always been a therapist that this thought about new reparative experiences and certainly with the relational turn of the 1990s when most research said that the relationship is the core for a curative experience they were all those process principles if you like fell into what one place for me yeah. so I probably would never have changed what I actually did I would still, and in fact, I ran a therapy group. I ran three therapy groups, um, and each group was three, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. I used to do three a year at the Manchester Institute, and um, I won, I, you know, I ran one recently, and I passed over, when I passed the actual psychotherapy, sorry, the tissues over to the client, I thought, because I knew somewhere in my head, this title was going to come up. And as I did it, it flashed in my brain and I still continue to do it. Because I believe we, by taking account of our clients, by presenting uh, that type of approach, we, may be, we are, and certainly for this person, who had years of neglect in her history, providing a different reparative experience. Yeah. And I, I know I've mentioned this in the past in one or two podcasts that we've done. I can remember, and I think it was on the one of the, the therapy marathons that I attended that you did, oh. that 
one of the first things that you used to do when I was sitting on the couch would you would you would literally consciously get the box of tissues and put them in between me and you and I used to think that was really crafty of you <laughs> and what is Bob doing he's playing he's messing with me head here but part of me felt like you were giving me permission to be emotional because mm. showing emotions is something that I always found quite difficult so it was kind of like you were just opening the door and saying it's absolutely fine if you do there's the tissues <laughs> yes and I do think that way I think in terms of therapeutic permissions that well that was how it felt for me yeah I did think you were very clever doing it by the way <laughs> in fact I did that the same in this uh, therapy intensive that I was thinking about recently, I put the two boxes of tissues, um, three, two in the middle of the room and one next to the two men. Yeah. So, so it, it's interesting that we can look at it in lots of different ways. The messages that, you know, are, are given out by a simple act in the therapy room, whether that's offering tea or tissues or where the person sits or all sorts of things it's all permissions and and potency and whatever else that goes on in a therapy room yeah when i first started off very long time ago in 1985 with my first client and i remember my first client well and i remember being so anxious and thinking about oh how should i have the therapeutic room should mm. i have some cushions and how should the cushions be? What colour should they be? Should they be far apart? Should I have a, what colour rug should I have? Should it be a nurturing environment? Should the chairs be a long way away from each other? But one thing that did shape all, all that I did, besides the super, my supervisor's thinking, was to provide a nurturing environment. Yeah. Now, this is way before the whole advent of what I'll call relationship psychotherapy for the sake of clinical theory. This was, um, I think, because I wanted to provide a environment which showed that I cared and taken account of the person that came through the door. Yeah. If somebody had said to me after that first session, if the supervisor said, oh, that's fine, but what about self-agency, empowerment, and all those other things? Because I was such an impressionable, naive therapist, would I have changed my thinking to a completely different approach? I don't know. But my supervisor came from um, the school that I came from, which was transaction analysis, and was very much into providing a nurturing experience or a reparative experience yeah. that clients might never have had. Yeah. Because in, this, this is where I work. This is my therapy room for anybody that's wow. watching. And I've got, you know, red throws on my chair. There's there's splashes of red on my chair, which is yeah. seen as not a good colour to have in a therapy room. Oh, I didn't know that. But that's my that's my personality. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's quite dull and muted, apart from bits of red that I've got in there. And do you know that red on the therapeutic lexicon <laughs> is supposed to represent anger? anger and danger and all the bad things oh, panic. you do know you do know yeah yeah but <laughs> that, whether that's me you know pushing a few buttons with the client in the room you know unconsciously or subconsciously I don't know but I I like a bit of red in there mm. well I'm a Manchester City supporter um and perhaps I should have light blue but I never have done but since you've just said that um but again psycho dramatists um people from different um, schools of thought may say, oh, well, we need to have a completely blank space. Yeah. Because once we start having different colours, we have different pictures, we have this on the wall, then two or three things happening. A client then can distract themselves by projecting XXX onto the wall. Um, and they can move away from what they need to be doing, which is um, the psychoanalysis or the psychotherapist work or interpretation whatever it is because they're projecting goodness knows what or could get triggered off by all these different objects and pictures yeah. and colors so people psychotherapists i think according to where they trained where what discipline they trained in 
whether it be humanistic or psychoanalytical, for example, will have different ways and methods of working in the therapy room. Yeah, it's a really interesting topic, you know, as a title, tissues and, and tea in the therapy room or whatever, it doesn't sound that much. But like you said, looking at it from lots of different perspectives and lots of different angles, it's it's quite, it's, it's a really in-depth topic. Yeah, and I think it represents the training, you know, the different ways that people have been trained at their different polarities. Yeah. Whether it's psychodynamic, whether it's, you know, psychoanalytical, whether it's psychosynthesis, whether it's transactional analysis, whether it's, you know, relational psychotherapy. Many of these different polarities have different ways of working and different methods. Yeah. And there's, is, is there also part of it our own personality plays in it as well? Well, it's an interesting one, that, isn't it? Because I think yes or no. If you've been trained very much around what I'm going to call a psychoanalytical frame or object relations frame or different types of uh, therapists on that side of the, then you may be trained around, you know, uh, not going down the road of maybe what could be seen as infantilization or, you know, lack of self-agency, empowerment, all the things I talked about. But if you're on the humanistic side or perhaps the relational side, that will determine. Now, the question, does your personality, I'll tell you what I think happens more. I think that your personality might determine which type of therapeutic discipline you follow. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. See, I would never have followed professionally a uh, discipline which is about interpretation which is about what i would see as a one up one down place yeah me uh, too. i would never have gone down that way no i'm much more attracted to a real in inverted commas a relational style of psychotherapy yeah and underneath all of this i'm a people pleaser and i like to make people cups of tea and coffee <laughs> Well, that's on, that's on another level but the, <laughs> but the issue the thing about that as a, as a psychotherapist that if you're a people pleaser you can run down the trap or uh, traps might be a strong word anyway or encourage unconsciously or even consciously the client adapting to the people pleasing part of you yeah rather than deciding what they want for themselves yeah yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. But I mean, it's useful to just be able to say that off, off the back. But I, I think it's important, as well as just saying that, we can also think about what that means clinically. Yeah. Which that that's one of the things that I think in the therapy process, we do need to think everything from a clinical perspective. And like I said, it, the messages that we're giving out, it's whether they're, they're being picked up at the other side with the same yeah, meaning or where does it get lost in translation? <laughs> that's very, very important, isn't it? Yeah. Because I think I come from the view that from the moment I open the door to the clients, to the moment, or whether the clients get buzzed in themselves, which is another story, Yeah. the moment they leave, we're always modeling things to them. Yeah. And from that frame of reference, they will always pick them up. How much they integrate them, that and how much they digest all that is perhaps another story, considering whether you know they have an antisocial frame of reference, whether they have a narcissistic frame of reference, whether they have a schizoid frame of reference. Yeah, yeah. Depend how much they take on board or they throw out, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want that tissue. Just I'm going to throw it back to you. Yeah. Oh, you always make me a cup of tea. I'm I, and they you know if they come from an antisocial frame of reference, then it's been interesting how much they will digest or adapt according to the therapy process, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and it's, yeah. it's about being aware of all of this stuff too. Yeah. yeah I remember. Uh, when was it? About a year, no, two years ago. 
a client who'd been in therapy with me for over 10 years um, knocked on my door and said she wanted to run this book by me and my name was in it and she wanted to do that out of courtesy um, etc etc and in the discussion that was very nice but one of the things in the discussion I want to share on this podcast was we were talking about what you what she remembered as so significant about the 10 years of psychotherapy now at one level i expected her to say all these or some of these wonderful interventions i made or some of this magnificent pieces of therapy we did or some of really deep regressive work we did did she say any of that no my narcissistic i was most disappointed because she's no was the answer she didn't <laughs> You know what she did say? She said, what I took away most of all, Bob, was your kindness to me. Oh, Yeah. But in the ballpark of what we're talking here and relationship psychotherapy and taking account of a client, yeah, I think it's very important. Absolutely. She said. I felt very moved, but, you know, it, it made me think Gosh, I didn't think she was going to say that. I thought she was talk about one of this wonderful pieces of work we actually did, which I remember. Yeah. The last thing I remembered was what she, what she actually came out with. But on reflection, what a lovely thing to say. And that's it. That when we're looking at things, you, you know, on the different levels, without you showing that kindness and her receiving it and making that relationship with you, would that empowering life transforming work ever have took place probably not <laughs> yeah certainly so it, it, it's food for thought uh, i think we, what we model down and the way we are has such a profound effects on our clients that often i don't i think reflect on that enough yeah another good podcast bob thank you so much i enjoyed talking about that thank you so what we're going to cover on the next one is falling in love with your client in the therapy process. Another one of my titles. Another one of your titles. I'm really interested in this and what we mean by falling in love with. Um, so okay. until next time, Bob. Take care. See you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.